equipped. I am empowered. I am encouraged. God has equipped you with everything that you need. He has already equipped you. He's empowered you, and he is an encouragement to you to keep moving forward into the path and into the destiny that he has placed before you. And inside of you, he has placed joy. And how many knows in the midst of this world, we need joy. We need all the joy that we can get. Amen. And it's inside of you right now. It's somewhere deep inside of you. If you're having trouble finding it this morning, you got to un unbury it. It might be buried by something, but it's in you. It is in you. You've got the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You just got to reach in and get it out. He's already given it to you. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning. Hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation. I've got a heart overflowing cause I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy When the valley that I wander Turns to mountains that I can climb Oh, you're with me, never leave me There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy Singing in my soul, got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I got an old church choir singing in my soul. I got a sweet salvation, and it's beautiful. I got a heart overflowing, cause I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Nothing gonna steal my joy. God knows everything. He knows absolutely everything. He knows your mind and he knows your thoughts. He knows your situations. He knows your circumstances better than you do. Even better than you do. And it's one thing to be loved. He loves you. He loves us with unending, yeah. pure love, unconditional love. It's one thing to be loved. And it's another thing to be loved and understood. And God understands. Yeah. Psalms 33, 14 through 15 says, From his throne he observes all who live on earth. He made their hearts, so he understands everything that they do. Amen. He understands. And if you have a situation that needs a healing, a circumstance that needs a healing, a family member, your body, your mind, God understands. He understands even more than you do. You have to let yourself remember to believe that he is who he says he is. You have to remember to believe. He is the healer. He is the healer of all things. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that he can do all things. Everything that you need, God can provide for you. He is your provider. And more than just food or money, he is your provider of all things, of everything that you need. You, he has equipped you. He has already equipped you. 
And he is your healer this morning and, and everything that you need a healing for, that's what he is. Just tell yourself this morning, remind yourself this morning that yes, you believe in who he is. And let God know, yes, God, I believe you are my healer. You own my every moment. You calm my raging seas. You walk me through the fire and heal all my disease. I trust. on the way to church this morning and um, it was about God being the God of breakthroughs 
And whatever you came in here this morning with, a weakness, your struggle, uh, your spirit, if you need a breakthrough through your worship, a healing, God is saying, I am the God of breakthroughs. And he is saying, I am still the same God of the Old and New Testament. I am a still miracle-working God. And he's saying, I'm still the same God, the God of your breakthrough. And he's saying, I will never leave you or forsake you. So just give God whatever you came in here with and claim that he is still that same God. You give life. You are love.
Because he is who he says he is. He is our God. He is our healer. He is our peacemaker. Our king. The light in this dark world. And I'm so thankful. Give your God some praise. Glorify him this morning. God's doing something right now. God is doing something right now in this moment. He is going to change somebody's life today. And that could be you. That life could be yours. God is so good. He's ready to ignite your destiny. And we got to rise up and we got to let him. Amen. Give your God some praise. And let's welcome our pastor as he comes. Well, keep your hands going and let's let the praise team know we do love you and we do appreciate you so much. What a blessing you are in the band. Thank you. I'm going to ask you to turn around to somebody and tell them I'm ready to do it. How many of you are willing and ready now for God to use you to do whatever he wants? Let me say it again. Whatever God wants. It's not what we want. It's what God wants. We've been learning of late that God has a destiny for us. And I want to tell you this morning, God's will lives in destiny. How many of you realize if you're going to have God's destiny, you have to have his will? If you're still fighting against his will, you're probably not going to arrive in that place of blessing. How many of you are ready for God to be in charge of your life and to rule and to reign and do things that you cannot do and allow his favor? Maybe seated if you like this morning. Very, very thankful. And I, I'm, Anybody in this room observant? Anybody? I'd say curious, but nosy is probably a better word. How many of you just try to figure everybody out? You try to figure out what makes people tick. And then after you figure it out, you wish you hadn't. And I want to say something. And I, I, I'm observing this more and more, and I think it's time for it to stop. There's so many times that we really don't want to submit to leadership. We, we've had people li literally leave church because somebody said, we need people to trust and trust leadership. So I don't need anybody. You can't tell me what to do. How many understand? You better listen to folks. Yeah, right. Listen to the ones that love you. I'm not talking about the people that are heading in the wrong direction. The Bible said, obey those that have the rule over you. How many know after all these years, we're not going to beat on you and we're not going to try to demand stuff out of you. We're going to try to guide you and direct you. Am I right? And so many times we wonder why that our children don't want to obey us because we don't want to obey God. Well, that'll preach right there. How many of you recognize if there's rebellion in my heart, it's going to pass to my family and my children? And I can't wonder why are they wanting, they don't want to obey. They don't want to be right. They don't want to listen. How many of you saying, because I'm not listening. One more time, say, that was real good, preacher. So I'm going to ask you to go back with me, if you will, to Scripture. We're going to share some heavy things. It won't take a long time, but something very powerful. In the book of Matthew, we're going to go to Matthew 3. 
one very important part, and I'm excited for this because when I look at the life of the Lord, please, please hear this. Before Jesus became flesh, he was ready to totally and completely obey his father. Designing the will of God, he came to this earth knowing he was going to suffer, knowing he was going to die, knowing he was going to save us, knowing it was going to hurt. Before he started it, he made up his mind, I want the will of God. You know, sometimes we want the will of God until it costs us something. <laughs> we want to be benevolent until our, our neighbor needs our help or Amen. We, we want to be a real blessing and, and, and until it, it hurts or it costs us. Are y'all getting this? And so what the Lord is telling me is that Jesus started his ministry by doing what his father wanted him to do. He started off by obedience. Look at chapter 3 of Matthew. I, I love this. It said, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was telling them to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It, it's arrived. It goes on down, if you will, and, and it says that the Lord um, came to him while he is baptizing the multitude in the Jordan River. And, and this is kind of confusing for a lot of people, but really, if you look at what, what John is saying in verse 11, he said, I indeed baptized with water under repentance, but the one that's coming after me is mightier than I. His shoes I'm not even worthy to bear or unloose. He will baptize you not with water, but with the Holy Ghost and fire. How many of you realize John is saying, I am doing a formula baptism. The water represents the word, and it represents you're going to die, and you're going to rise again. But the one that's coming after me is not just going to baptize you with the water. He's going to give you the fire. Yeah. Anybody understand there's a s symbol there that is powerful. God has ways of letting water have just as much power as fire or fire as water. But if you notice what Jesus is doing, the very first thing Jesus does is he is willing as he begins his ministry, he begins to obey the Father, and he came to John and he said, I want you to baptize me. Verse 13. Then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him. He refused. He said, I have need to be baptized of you. You're greater than I. Why are you coming to me? Look at verse 15. Jesus answered and said unto him, Allow it or suffer it to be so now. For thus it becometh to you and I, us, to fulfill all righteousness. And he was baptized of John. Let me just say this. The first thing I want you to get about Jesus' ministry, he started off with a determination. I'm going to do the will of the Father all my life. Well, what if I don't want to do it next month? Do it. Amen. Jesus didn't say if it gets tough, I'll quit. He started off. What did he do first? He went to the baptism in the river. Why? Because as a symbol to all future generations, Jesus is saying, for me to fulfill the will of the Father, to be able to save you, heal you, and deliver you, the first thing I have to do is die out to my flesh. Amen. Anybody understand? Your flesh will mess with you. Your flesh is the main thing that's going to get you in trouble. I'm not talking about your skin. I'm talking about your carnal man and your carnal will taking authority over the will of God for your life. Can I get one amen? amen. So Jesus, look at me symbolically. Jesus said, Mary's baby, this, this outer realm is symbolically going to die. They're going to bury me in the water, and I'm going to get up. And when he got up, what's the first thing that God did? The Holy Spirit spoke and said, now this is my beloved son. Not the flesh one that had to be buried in the water as a symbol of dying out to the flesh, but the one that got up. How many of you realize you and I are not going to be effective in any realm of the kingdom as we live by our flesh? But when you start living not after the flesh, but after the spirit, God can do anything through you he wants to do. So that's why baptism is important. It's a symbol that it's not you that lives any longer. It's Christ that took you over. How many like to see Christians that are no longer themselves, but now they're like Jesus? Amen. So when you go to them and you trust in them with confidence, you can tell them your pain or your need, and they won't divulge it because you're not talking to their flesh, their gossiping spirit. You're talking to the Christ inside of them. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is baptized, the symbol of dying out to his will. Look at me. The first thing he did was die out to his carnal nature. 
It'd be really good if all Christians would just start out dead. <laughs> and then let Christ live through you to do things his way. Anybody think the church might be a little better off? Anybody think the world might want what we have? Fast forward to Matthew 4. Jesus is just baptized, gets up out of the water. The Father affirms him and is well pleased with him. And then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Boy, that takes a while for most people to wrap their brain around. Immediately after he laid down his will, now the Spirit, everybody say the Spirit. God's Spirit led him into the wilderness to what? To be tempted of the devil. In other words, to be tempted to prove his flesh was under control. Wouldn't it be nice if all Christians had their flesh under control? Y'all give me some amens. I got several over there. I'm getting in you on this side. Wow. He was led of the Spirit. Into the wilderness, all alone, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. Has anybody ever fasted? Anybody just, how many of you fast between meals? Or <laughs> I'm not talking about fasting bubble gum. Now we fast bubble gum or we fast Pepsi or something. Jesus did not eat for 40 days. And afterward, he was hungry. I got to tell you, if you're talking about me, I can fast for a week. And by the end of the week, I would even take a White Castle. <laughs> the Spirit's going to forgive me for saying that. But how many of you realize 40 days he has had nothing to eat? And I want to clarify something. Fasting is not to buy anything from God. Fasting is to put your flesh under subjection. Because if you could refrain from eating, you could probably refrain from anything. Amen. Say amen. amen. How many of you, even when you're not eating, think about food? Come on, and before you get finished with the meal, you're already getting dessert in your mind. It's sort of like one of my old friends in town. He would go to the restaurant with us and have dessert first. I said, why are you eating dessert first? He said, life's uncertain. <laughs> he already had it on his mind. Come on, some of you, i got to be quiet right now because you're already thinking about the buffet or something. Come on, stay with me for a few minutes. If you look at the scripture, Jesus now has been led into the wilderness by the Spirit to prove, look at me, prove that he was qualified to be the savior qualified not to be led as the leader of humanity as the leader of our as our savior he was willing to let us know my flesh is not going to yield to my will 40 days i mean after 40 days you will be hungry and you know the enemy doesn't sometimes tempt you when you're in church but somehow he sits out there past the steps and he Wants to get in the car with you on your way home. Amen. You can get along with saints, but you just want to tell somebody off outside. Amen. Amen. Say this with me. God needs to deal with my flesh and my tongue. Amen. There's a whole lot of Christians ruining their testimony by their tongue. I've heard Christians say stuff and I thought, I thought you knew Jesus. Amen. Come on. I was thinking on the way in this morning, isn't it amazing that some people, they only love Jesus a little tiny bit. You have to always go around saying, oh, come on, love him. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. You're a Christian. Come on, love Jesus. Excuse me. If you fall in love with that woman, that man, nobody has to come and say, hey, tell him you like him. How many of you say, you're going to tell him? Am I, am I, I'm doing counseling right now. didn't mean to do that. And when the devil, the tempter, came to him after 40 days. Everybody say, 40 days. And this is what he said, if you are the son of God, what do you mean if I am? See, sometimes the devil comes to you as soon as you get out of church and say, you're not saved. I saw that person run out in front of you and, and, and made you stop and they took your place at the line at Walmart. And I saw that attitude right. You're not a Christian. Anybody heard the devil tell you you're not really saved? Anybody sometimes just don't feel real saved? Am I in the right building? And the devil himself says to Jesus while he is hungry, if you are the son of God, can I paraphrase? Gratify your flesh. One of the biggest problems we have as humans is instant gratification. We don't even want to wait till dinner. We want to grab a snack bar. Am I right? I could go somewhere with this. 
How many of you understand the enemy would always like for you to just yield to instant gratification? True. So the devil said to him, if you really are the son of God, command these stones right here to be made into bread. I, I don't know how to explain that any better, but in Springfield, we have a Klosterman's Bakery. I don't care if I just got up from the table. When they're baking that bread, I find myself grabbing the steering wheel and starting to turn in to their parking lot. There's just something about the smell of, of hot bread. Am I right? I can get a vision of a whole stick of butter laying on the top of that loaf of bread. And I can see as the butter's running down my... Y'all still here? There's just something about it. And if I fasted 40 days and I'm hungry and all of a sudden I don't look at the rocks and see rocks anymore. I look at those rocks and I see a big old loaf of French bread. Y'all still here? Because the devil knows when to tempt you. And he knows what you like. How does he know that? Because he's been watching what works with you. Amen. 40 days and he said, if you are the son of God, can I, can I divert for a minute? Can I just get off the track a minute? You know what he's really saying? You're out here in the wilderness. Nobody will know. Just tear off some bread and eat it real quick and nobody will know. Have you ever had the devil tell you that you can get away with sin because you're by yourself? Most bad sins are done when you're alone. Or you're not around your strength people. It's getting so quiet in here, I know I hit a home run. If you're the son of God, prove it. I've had people come to me and say, if you're really a prophet, of, if you're really a man of God, my family's here. And if you go minister to them, and, and they'll get saved. Excuse me? What if, what if I don't minister to them? I'm still a man of God. Amen. 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 Oh, if you're really real, you'll heal this one. There's a, some friends who wrote, a, there's a song out right now that says, if Jesus had never done a miracle, he would have still been God. Amen. He only did miracles to encourage us. Amen. And sometimes it'd be better for some people if he never healed them, because when some people don't get healed, they get mad at God, so then you lose them. I'm just helping you right now. If you are the son of God, see that rock over there? Turn it into a big old loaf of bread and, and chow down. And the Lord answered and said, no, it's already written. I've already determined this. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I love this because, and I can tell you what I spoke today, what the praise team said, what Haley said, what you've heard in ministry, that word will continue to hit you in the ear all week long. It is not just a word for now. It is a proceeding word, a continuum word. It will continue to strengthen. It will continue to reinforce you. So what Jesus is saying... God, my Father, already wrote that man will not live by bread alone, but by that word that's alive that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil takes him up to the holy city, makes him religious, and he sets him on the pinnacle of the temple. He takes him to the highest place. He, he takes him to the place where the, the, the great ones would like to go. He, he takes him to the high place of the, of the temple of God. Wow. I've read this all my life, and I've heard it preached all my life, and I didn't get it until this week. And the devil said to him, if you be the son of God, cast yourself down. Throw yourself off the temple. What? Did you read what I just told you? The devil said, cast yourself down. I can't cast you down. You got to make up your own mind to take yourself out. Oh, it's so-and-so's fault. They made me stumble. You decided to stumble. They were an enabler, but you have to make up your own mind, and you have to tell yourself, I am not going to let the devil cast me down because he can't. And I will not cast myself down. Everybody say, if I'm defeated, it's my fault. Come on, let, let's just claim it. Say it. If I messed up, I did it. Oh, I was influenced. I'm not talking about influence. You ultimately made the decision. I am not going to do it, or I'm going to do it. We learned in, in bodybuilding a few months ago the reason that people do what they do, even the bad stuff, because they want to. Yeah. Well, I don't want to admit that. Admit it or not, it's true. Yeah, sure. How many understand the truth will make you free? Yeah. And so he's saying to the Lord at the pinnacle of the temple, he's saying, throw yourself down. You know what? That doesn't sound even smart 2,000 years later. But isn't it funny that 2,000 years later, the devil is still telling people to take themselves out, and they're doing it. 
Again, let me say it. He can't do it to you. He's defeated. He knows he can't do it. He can suggest stuff. He can bring back picture memories of things that you enjoyed from the past. And he can remind you the good stuff, but he doesn't remind you of what it cost you. Have no sin will always cost you something. Amen. Amen. So he is saying, just cast yourself down for, you know, I, I, what the devil is saying. I, I know some of the word. He, he promised he'd give his angels charge concerning you and, and in their hands. And they'll bear you up anytime you dash your foot against a stone. Look at me. Is there a difference in kicking a rock with your foot and jumping off the temple? The devil uses scriptures, but he never uses them right. He always twists them a little or uses part of a scripture. Some of the biggest problems we have in the church world today is because the preacher's preaching part of a verse. If it's not in the scripture validated at least twice or three times, cannot be made doctrine. Am I right? So the devil is saying to Jesus, if you really are what you say you are, jump. You know, your father said that even if you kick a rock, his angels will pick you up. There's no scripture that said if you jump off the temple to bash your brains out that God will have mercy on you in your rebellions or your lack of wisdom so Jesus is saying I'm not going to cast myself down I feel like I ought to just say this everybody in this house please promise me this week you're not going to take yourself out I could jump right now but it wouldn't kill me can you imagine the devil thinking Jesus is so simple that he doesn't know his own word. Our problem is sometimes we don't know enough of the word to keep us in balance. True? That's why you need to live by every word. If you haven't read the Bible, plan to do it this year. Don't just fast forward, read it. Get a good head knowledge of it. Come on, start off with the new covenant, and then as you understand that, you can go back to the old that validates it. I want you to get a hold of this. Jesus is saying to him, it is already written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil takes him to an exceeding high mountain. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said unto them, all of these will I give you if you'll fall down. You know, the devil's into falling down. And isn't it funny how he always talks us into falling down? How many of you ever had the devil talk you into something that made you fall down? So it's still working. See, the devil doesn't have any new tricks. He just repeats the old stuff. Amen. True. Well, it worked on them one time before. I'll wait a little while until they forget it, and I'll try that again. But Jesus, notice this, what he is saying. I'm going to give you all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you all the pleasures of the world and the glory of them. Can I just say this? Which would you rather have? All the stuff that the enemy could give you if you had the power to give it, which you won't and can, or the pleasure of God in your life? Walking in God's favor. Because when everything blows up and every blessing falls apart and all my friends walk away, he will never leave me or forsake me. Lo, he will be with me always. Why? Because I have chosen to have him as the authority of my life. Now notice this. It's, it's not always easy to say, no, I would like to have that. And I would like to own Disney World. Or I would like to have this or that. And the Lord is saying, no, I have something better for you. What God has for you is not physical. It is not temporary. What God has for us is eternal and can never be taken from our life. I'll give you all of this and what I love about this is the fact that the devil doesn't own any of it. The devil is created. He doesn't own anything except the power to lie to you, deceive you, and try to talk you into being like he wants you to be so he can destroy you forever. He only has three plans. Kill, steal, destroy. If you remember that the next time he's talking to you, find out what category it is. Kill, steal, destroy. I've made up my mind. I don't want to hear that. I don't have to belong to that. I have a heavenly father that loves me. And it is already written that I belong to the king. And I don't have to fall down and worship him. He owns all things. When did he create anything? He doesn't own anything. I'm going to say this. He cannot give you joy. He can give you some kind of a supplement that will make you feel happy for a moment. Until the pill wears off or the happiness wears off. But he cannot give you peace and joy. He can excite you and stimulate you with flesh. But how many after a while, flesh will fail. What God wants to give you is something that will never fail. 
Then Jesus said to him, Get ye hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and only him will you serve. So the devil left him, and the angels came and ministered to him. I want to explain something in this context because this is the first month and a half of Jesus' ministry. Forty days out of the water, forty days after being baptized, he had to deal with his flesh. Can I tell you the problems that we face in the church and we face in our life are all stemming from our flesh. You know what? I wish I could get every young Bible school, college student, every young person heading into the ministry to learn. Put your flesh under subjection first. It's key. Jesus proved that his flesh was not going to submit to the enemy. Amen. Amen. Even God in the flesh proved to the enemy, I'm not going to obey you. Can I just tell you this? The temptations are going to come in life as long as you live. Temptations are not going to come just because you come to the altar and we lay hands on you and you feel good. How many temptations are going to be there? All the days of your life. Can you imagine how many times the enemy tried to take Jesus out or discourage him in three and a half years of constant ministry? Can you imagine how many times he had to submit to the will of the Father and not to the will of the enemy? I've got to tell you, the enemy has promised me a whole lot of stuff that he couldn't fulfill, but it sounded good at the moment. Anytime the devil's talking, he's trying to distract you from the will of God. Your destiny lives inside the will of God. Am I right? If you're not walking in the will of God, you don't have a God destiny. I promise you, if you get out of God's destiny, there's another one. And it will hurt you, wound you, destroy you, and your family, and your future. That's why the Lord has given us and set before us a goal. I, I, I'm not going to take along with this, but I believe every one of us need to understand uh, a context. Let, let me close with Matthew, or Luke, rather, the 22nd chapter. Jesus had just gone with the disciples and prepared a, a final supper, a meal. It's called the Seder. It's the final time when Jesus was with them explaining the value of the blood, explaining the, the lamb sacrifice, explaining uh, the symbolism of what we call today communion. It's only a symbol of what was real because he himself was not just taking bread. He was saying, my body is going to be devoured. My blood is going to be poured out. I want you to take me inside of you. And that's what we do in symbolism when it comes to communion. But listen closely. Jesus is praying in the garden, and the Bible said that he prayed with such emphasis and such power. I feel like saying it again. Jesus started off by putting his flesh under, so his ministry was not hindered. He closes out his ministry by putting his flesh under control. The first thing he does, the last thing he does. Read it. Verse 42. Father, if... If you're willing, remove this cup from me. What did he just say? Father, if this is in your divine will, that I could have this death, scourge, beating, spearing, spitting, hate, anger. If I could have that moved and you've got any other way, if there's any other way, my flesh doesn't want to have to be mauled and stripped and killed. His flesh is saying... I don't want to have to suffer. The last thing he's dealing with is putting his flesh under subjection. Why? Because his flesh is the only flesh that could be ripped open for your healing with his stripes. He had to be willing to decrease so that God's will could increase. He had to be willing to die so that we could live. It wasn't easy. His flesh didn't want to die. I'm dealing with a number of people right now that are either facing death or they're on, on some kind of a final resuscitary system or there's some kind of a situation where hospice has stepped in. And, and the concern in their mind is, I don't know what th th death is going to be. I don't, I don't want to face that. How many realize nobody wants to face death? Jesus knew within hours he was going to be scourged. He was going to be nailed. He was going to be speared. They were going to drop him in a hole and disjoint every joint in his body. He knew that he was going to die. So he says, Father, if, if there's any other thing that would provide your will, I want your will to be done. 
How willing are we to, as Dara often says, stretch out our other hand and let them nail that one? I've been hurt before. Am I going to trust people and let them hurt me again? Yeah. I've been betrayed by people. I'm still going to trust people. I've had dear friends stab me in the back. I'm still going to hug people. I've had people walk away that I blessed. Amen. I took food out of my plate and out of my table and out of my cupboard to provide for them. And they turned around and turned on me. Am I going to stop giving? No. Why? Because something of Christ lives on the inside. And what Jesus is saying, Father, I know it's going to be agony and I'm going to suffer like no one has ever suffered before. Look at what he is saying. If it's your will, if there's any other way and you can still have your will without this. Remove this cup of death and passion from me. Nevertheless, not my will. But thy will be done. There appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening. Did you notice in the beginning when we talked about Jesus in the wilderness that after 40 days the angels came to minister to him. Here he is right now in his passion. An angel ministers to strengthen him. I want you to look at me a second. I want to say something really heavy. There's times that when you're in the will of God, God doesn't remove the problem. He strengthens you to go through it. The angels came while Jesus is sweating blood, agonizing in his flesh to put flesh under subjection. And the angels came and ministered to him, but they did not stop what he was going through. How many of you want to go through what God wants you to go through? And not bail out because your flesh is messed up. Thy will be done in earth, not on earth, in earth as it's being done in heaven. Your destiny depends on walking in the will of God. There's no other way you can have it. I want to stand before God one day and have clean hands and a pure heart. I can't do that if I've lived after my flesh. This flesh is not that important. Come on, say amen. Amen. The Bible said in being in agony, this is the Lord, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he arose from prayer and was come to the disciples, he found them sleeping For sorrow. Read a lot of times, but that stuck out to me today when I read it. They were sleeping because they were so sorrowful. They should have been awake helping him carry their sorrow. But what their sorrow did to them was make them run to sleep. Have you ever had people that when they're told somebody said, you're going to have to stop eating and lose some weight or you're going to die. You know what they do? They run to the kitchen and get something to eat. We run to the things that hurt us. They ran to sleep when they needed to be awake. Why? Because their flesh needed sleep. They gratified their flesh rather than stay alive and strengthen their Lord. How many want to be available to the Lord let him use you? Is anybody getting anything out of this yet? What I want to say, and this is very powerful and yet it's very important. The Lord is saying, Father, if even if I have to go through the whipping, the scourging, and the dying... I know it's going to be painful. My mind can't comprehend it. I've known this before I left heaven, that I was going to be nailed to a cross. And they were going to beat me. They were going to spear me. I I, I knew that all along. They were going to put a crown of thorns on my head. I knew all of that. But I was willing to do that. That's why I came. It's not enough to begin the race. It's those that endure to the end. The same. I have ministry friends that started out great. Did phenomenal things in the kingdom. Now they're sitting hibernating somewhere in anger or selfishness or in their flesh. You know why? Because they didn't continue to say, Lord, your will. They got hung up on their will and it's destroying them every day. I want to stand before the Lord and have him say, you were faithful. Come on, say with me, faithful. Sometimes faithful is not doing a lot. It's just being there, just being faithful. I recognize we're looking at an hour, and this year is going to be the most amazing year of your life. I've looked around at how many people in the last months and, and the months before us. So we're going to see death like we haven't seen it. We're going to see it in high places. We're going to see changes in every area of life. If I've ever told you, I'm going to tell you today, if you want God's will, make up your mind right now that you're going to have the will of God because you're going to be tested. You're going to have a contest with yourself and with the world and with your friends and your family. You've got to make up your mind. I want the will of God for my life. Whatever it takes, I'm going to have God's will. Jesus was faithful to the end because he's the only one that could save us and deliver us. Did you know that your salvation was in his decision-making process in the garden? He didn't say, Father, I've suffered enough. Nobody likes me. 
They're all walking away. I've healed thousands and tens of thousands, and I've blessed all these people. And look, I don't have anybody. Even my disciples are asleep. How many of it's real easy to get offended at people? I don't really understand offense because we always take it out on God. Amen. This church should be jammed out all the way to Cartwright's junkyard. People ought to be standing in line all the way down the street to get in. Well, why don't you go to church? Well, you know, they, I don't like that message. Excuse me? Somebody got my parking place. Somebody sits in my chair. I didn't want green chairs anyway. I wanted blue chairs. I don't like that praise and worship on the wall, written up on the screen. I want it in a book. Get over it. Amen. Jesus didn't have a screen or a book. He didn't have green chairs. They sit out in the yard. Amen. But if you're looking for an excuse, any excuse will do. Well, somebody offended me. Well, find somebody else to like. There's 7 billion people on the planet. That excuse won't work. Amen. Now I'm going to talk just to you. Temptation is going to come to you. When I left home as a child, I... I realized I was going to fight battles. My father, my pastor, my father, my best friend talked to me and he told me about some of the things I was going to have to, to suffer, some of the things I'd have to endure. But I decided to serve God anyway. Amen. I knew it wasn't going to be easy, but I made up my mind. I'm going to begin this race and I'm going to end it. Amen. I may not be as fast as a rabbit. I'll get there like the turtle. I'm going to get there. Right. Right. And I'm going to be faithful along the way. Because yeah. you know what matters in life is not what people want you to do. It's doing what God wants you to do. <laughs> you know what? You don't have to please anybody but him. And most of the time you won't. Because most people don't like you. <laughs> okay, I said it. And if they do, after a while they won't. You'll do something, you'll say something, and they won't like you. Say man, you know it's true. I used to think everybody liked me until I overheard them. Come on. Anybody like to unhear some stuff? But the one that knows me best loves me most. Amen. I'll give credit to David Brander for that, and that's the last time you get credit. Let's close. Today we're going to receive these elements of communion. The last thing Jesus did with the disciples before they decided to go to the land of Nod and sleep, he told them what he was going to suffer. They got so sorrowful over that, they decided just to, just to sleep. Nobody gets saved because the preacher's asleep. Or fails to watch with the kingdom. My heart is breaking today because I look back over 50 years plus in ministry. And I recognize what happens when people begin the race in faithfulness. But then somehow, some way, their flesh finally yields to the enemy. I asked Lloyd Yoho. Some of you remember Yoho. He was about 95, I think. Buried him nearly 100 and I said, well, I just want to ask you a question. How, how old do you have to be before you stop being tempted? He said, well, Pastor, you have to ask somebody older than me. <laughs> he still liked the girls. He still thought people, come on, just they're trying to help you here. He's my friend, and he, you know, he'd go around and set up meetings for me when he was 90. I'm talking about moving all the equipment. Can I tell you that whatever temptation you're fighting right now is not worth it? Can you look back at any time you ever stumbled in temptation and it ever profited you anything? Why did Jesus start off his ministry by saying, I'm going to prove to the world and to myself, I'm not going to be tempted and yield to do anything the devil tells me. If you'll take that principle into your life, everything will be all right for the rest of your life. If I don't get to preach to you ever again, I gave you something to hang on to and God's will will be done in your life. If God's will is done in your life, then he can say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you fulfilled my will and my plan. Let's everyone stand for a moment. So Jesus was baptized to symbolize that it was no longer his will that lived, but God's will through his life. In the final hours of his life, he went to the garden and he prayed, Father, now I want you to know this, that I'm going to ask that your will be done. Even in my death, my burial and my resurrection. I never thought of it before, but can I tell you that I want God's will in my death? When it's my time, I want it to be God's time. I want God to be pleased. I want to be able to say, fought a good fight, kept the faith. Amen.
Look at me. What else matters? Nothing in this world matters. Bow your head for a moment. Father, if there's one watching or there's one here today, on this cold and snowy wintry day here in Ohio, I realize that someone has had the fire of anointing burning in their spirit to put their flesh under subjection. They're not going to yield to the enemy to their destruction or to the destruction of their children or their children's children ever again. They're going to say, as you did in the garden in agony, Father, your will be done whatever it costs and whatever it, whatever it means. If you're fighting a battle you can't win, it's time to let the Lord become your strength. We never want to close a service without giving an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ because so many people know him as a character in the Bible or someone their parents told them about, but they don't really know him. They've never really been born into the kingdom of God. If you're born in the kingdom of God, nobody has to talk you into liking him. Nobody has to talk you into wanting to read about him or studying his word or getting around people that love him and glorifying his name or singing a song of his greatness. Nobody has to talk you into loving him if you love him. If you've never received him as Lord of your life, not just an acquaintance or a friend, please don't leave this room until you do that. The call of God upon my heart and my life right now and the mandate that God has placed this last couple of months. We began this year and God said, I am going to ignite the fire of destiny in my people. Some want my will and some don't want it. But if you'll preach to them my will, the ones that make a choice will thank you for all of eternity. That you gave them an option to get rid of their will and allow the will of the Father to rule and reign in their life. I speak life to you today. Some of you right now have an attitude that you got from your daddy or your mama, your grandma, your grandpa. Bury it. It's going to hurt you and you're going to make wrong decisions. Wrong choices that will affect you and your future generation. Legacy will not be sweet and powerful. It will be maimed and destroyed. Daddy, let your sons know that you love God. Mama, let your children and your grandbabies know that you love Jesus more than anything in the world. Let them know by your actions that the devil is not going to talk you out of obeying God. Talk you out of serving God. Talk you out of worshiping God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. There's going to be death this year because of rebellion. The Bible said, he that is often reproved hardens his heart, stiffens his neck, will be cut off, and that without a remedy. Why? Because God will not force himself on you, but destruction will come because you don't allow God's protection. He that is often reproved, he that thinks it's a joke to serve God, he that has heard God warn him time and again and just mocks God, has no other source of safety, and destruction will come in a moment. Father, I'm asking you to let me preach it longer and louder so that no one that's under the sound of my voice will fall under that. But that we'll become willing today to let your will and your destiny for our life become manifest. I accept it and I decree it in Jesus' name. Can we say it together in Jesus' name? Just keep your eyes closed for just a moment if you will. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to ask you to pray. You already paid for it, and we already receive it. Your will be done. We're going to walk this out and come forward. Testimonies of the power of the Lord in I feel like taking a moment before we receive the communion to say this. While your eyes are closed, I want you to get a mental picture of someone that you love. They know about God. They've heard about Jesus a hundred times. But the tempter is more important or more powerful over their life right now than God is by choice. I'm going to ask you to claim a loved one. 
right now. Jesus claimed all of us as he said to the Father, not my will, I will suffer whatever it cost so that all future humanity can have a gift of salvation for the sick to find their healing, the bound to find their deliverance, the lost to find their way. I want you to name that name in the heavenlies right now. Speak it. There may be several. Speak those names. I claim the sinner nearest hell. I claim the sick nearest death. I claim the bound nearest destruction for life and freedom and salvation. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Father, I ask that they receive a desire for your will, a desire for your kingdom to come, for your will to be done. I can't make that happen. I can't talk them into it. I can't beg them into it. You, Holy Spirit, have to deal with their heart to want you and your will. Father, we've never asked before like this, but I'm asking that we crave your will to be done, whatever it takes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Come on, everybody say it together. In Jesus' name. Would you, would you recite this with me? Lord, help me conquer my flesh. It's the enemy of God. The enemy of the will of God. The enemy that will destroy all that God wants to do in my life. Help me conquer flesh. For I'm no longer carnal. I'm spiritual minded. Which means I want your will to be done. For your glory. In Jesus name. Can we clap our hands and praise God for the opportunity to begin again. Following after the will of the Father. Following after the plans of the Father. Remain standing if you will. Often lately Haley's been talking about Hebrews 11. All the hall of fame of the great miracles and the miracle workers in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It goes down to the end of the chapter and it tells the miracles and then it says, but there are some that had to suffer. They did not get their answer and they died. How many of you are willing to serve God even if you don't get things your way? How many of you know if God gets His will, we should be happy? Are you willing for God's will? If you can say that and honestly say it, you're living in God's destiny. And the enemy is defeated and every area of your life becomes victory starting this day. Can we clap our hands and praise Him?